really, really excited to be here to talk about um, me, my experience, whatever is useful and interesting to this audience. So I was Hitlery's CTO. I joined the campaign in April of 2015. It was just me by myself. And by the end of the campaign, I hired 80 engineers, product managers, designers. Um, we ran all the technology components to the campaign. That includes, we, we built and ran them. So anything you saw on the website, so hillaryclinton.com, the donation pages, the policy experiences, the register to vote, how, where do I vote, um, all of that. We built mobile apps to run the caucus. We built mobile apps for the convention. We built all the analytics infrastructure. Um, we built fun things, like if you saw on the debate night, the first debate with Trump, we had a fact checker. And oh, she yeah. mentioned that was it. probably going wild. Yes, she mentioned that on the, on the stage, and that was a big part of the sort of debate experience. Um, we built lots of social tools like Love Trump's Hate, where you could make a beautiful video of yourself and share your story. Um, yeah, so we built everything, organizing tools, volunteer tools, um, canvassing tools to make it easier for people knocking on doors. We built a great text messaging app um, that we used to activate tens of millions of voters and text people, which was sort of a new experience this cycle. Um, so yeah, so I'm really proud. I think the, the technology team at Hillary was innovative and amazing, and they came from companies like Google and Charity Water and Etsy and um, the New York Times and some had worked in politics before but most had not and it was just, I think it's a, an amazing story and I think one of the biggest tech startups of um, 2016. I heard about the fact checker and I was talking to some journalists last night mm. and it was interesting, they said because of the fact checker, which was the first time we had something like that, it was the um, interviewers, mm. you know, the anchors had to be so seasoned on how to, you know, kind of shift their direction. So they were getting groomed. They were in a, a room for a month getting trained because of that fact checker. So I think that you really did revolutionize, yeah. you know, those um, uh, debates, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah, so what's your background? Yeah, so I um, in a, I'm, came from Stanford. I studied uh, computer science and electrical engineering, and I um, started my career at Cisco Systems. Cisco makes pretty much every networking piece of technology that powers the whole internet, so routers and switches, and I worked there for six years. Um, and then I moved over to Google. Who's heard of Google? <laughs> right? Okay, Little not everyone. Company. Not Little everyone. company. You know. Small company. Yeah. Um, and I spent 10 years there, my first few years building Gmail. I was the product lead for Gmail from about a million to 100 million users. I moved to Google Zurich in 2006. If you can believe it, in 2006, we only really had Google Maps in the US and the UK. And I launched Google Maps in every single country in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, so that was an exciting and Bad wonderful ass. time. <laughs> and then I moved to uh, Sydney, Australia, and built a product called Google Wave. Has anyone heard of Google Wave? Really? Did you use it? No. No, okay. <laughs> but I still love you. And that's amazing. Google Wave was an experiment to build a new type of communication and collaboration tool, and it has a lot of themes of Slack. Like, I love Slack more than anything. We ran the campaign on Slack. That same sort of advanced IRC tool was what we were trying to build. Um, and then my last job at Google was really running the ph philanthropy arm at Google. And that's actually the closest I work with Megan Smith, who's the CTO of the United States. A and lot the, of you have met Megan. So Megan is one of our girls in the Girls' Lounge, comes with us, you know, everywhere, and is amazing. And, you know, it is also how we got introduced. Yes, so. how we got connected. So Google.org is an amazing part of Google. There's part um, philanthropic grants. They give money to nonprofits. But my part of Google.org was an engineering organization. And we try to apply Google's engineering talent to the hardest humanitarian problems. So we worked on things like disaster response, civic engagement in elections, transparency in elections. Um, we worked with uh, Doctors Without Borders building tools for Ebola treatment centers. We worked a lot on developing philanthropic giving as a muscle in people. Um, so I was really proud of all of that work. And I think that's the journey that got me to the Hillary campaign. Because I think they had a search committee for their CTO and I had done Google's elections work for a while. And anything you saw for India, Brazil, or the US midterms in 2014, my team built those tools. And so I think that's how they found me. That's amazing. And so were all these, of your 80, engineers, were they part-time? Like, what happens during an election time? Do they all just take a hiatus from their job and go back to their job, or do they have to leave their job to come? Yeah, I think most people left their jobs. I think um, partially it was, I um, had a hard time hiring. You know, in April of 2015, it didn't feel urgent to people to join and participate in the election. But in truth for technology, you need to develop early, because there's only certain moments of adoption. 
And if you're going to suddenly have 10,000 field organizers working on the primaries in June of 2015, then you need tools for them to be effective in their job. So it was sort of a mismatch because I needed people early, but people's interest in the campaign came much later. And most of the early people um, uh, left their jobs. So they didn't take sabbaticals, they left their jobs, they worked full time on the campaign. Starting midway through um, summer of 2016, we got a few people on sabbatical. One from Pinterest and a few from other companies. But the thing I'm most proud of and excited to tell this audience was at the peak, not at the end, but at the peak um, when we were about 60 people, our team was 40% women. That's amazing. And that was an extremely hard uh, kind of uh, to achieve because you know, there is, we all know, and you know, part of the joy of having spaces like this is not as many women choose computer science. And so to get that many women, we had to go and recruit in all the places with the great organizations like Girls Who Code, um, Black Women Code. Um, we just went everywhere in New York City and tried to recruit. And once you have women on your team, it feels different, it looks different, people have an experience different when they interview. And so I think once we had a good number of women on the team, it made it easier to recruit more women. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about that because you know, here in the Girls Lounge, it is 99.9% .9 women and you know the 0.1% men and we are the majority yeah. here and so when you're in this space i mean i don't know about you guys but you feel really empowered and you feel and act like a majority and that really is what i don't get why corporate america doesn't understand mm -hmm. when you change the numbers all of a sudden the rest will flow yeah. you know yeah. it's hard to come in as a minority i don't know if this is a taboo topic or not mm -hmm. so you know, take it or leave it and redirect everyone me. Got, everyone got quiet when you said that. Yes. Like, big question. It is a big question. Is there any way, do you think, because technology obviously is a great way of getting information quickly and connecting, but we still need the human interaction to interpret and contextualize. Is there anything that you think you could have done differently from a technology perspective to hear and listen more? Or do you feel that was just the human element of you know, understanding. You know, we talk about technology is a great connector and a great enabler. Yeah. We still need human intervention. Yeah. Was there more technology that we could have used? I think there's Versus always more you could do. Like I don't I, like if you. I, I like. I think being a learning being and trying to look at what happened and the outcome and learn from it and think about it. Like there's actually nothing else I do with my time. I think the hard thing is. Um, most people working in engineering environments, they're not such rigid deadlines. Like we had a fixed amount of time and we had the resources were basically wholly dependent on the amount of money we could raise. So with more time, more money or more people, I think we could have done different things. But what would that have been? Like I've been in the polling business. I, do, I used to do movie tracking. Yeah. And I would um, ask people what movie they plan to see and on a Friday and I would put a number out and do a prediction and by Monday, we knew if we were right or wrong because we had the box office data. Yeah. And there was a movie we embarrassingly missed on. Okay. And it was Passion of the Christ. Mm -hmm. And it was the Mel Gibson movie. And we missed because we polled moviegoers. And what we found was it was non-moviegoers that actually saw the movie because it was this cult film. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we predicted like 12 million and open to 80 million. Like yeah. we just goofed because we were going after the, the, the prediction, you know, what we, we looked at the patterns, yeah. but this was a non-pattern. Yeah. And I think this election was just a disruptive election that, you know, we couldn't look at what was yeah. Dem, Republican, states by state. Is there something in technology that now in hindsight you think about, if you were to create this again, what would you add to it? Have you thought about that? I, there's just no easy answer. Like, I hear you. And like, I think trying to understand why we got it so wrong and why so much data was telling us a different outcome. They were the, all surprised. The learnings will take a long time and there's no one easy answer. But what I would say from a technology point of view, we, we have to make decisions by how much you're talking to your supporters and trying to activate your supporters. Because get out the vote is just as important, if not 100%. more important, than persuasion. Some people think a lot of running campaigns is trying to get people persuaded to your side. In truth, disproportionately, Democrats don't turn out to vote. And it is not compulsory to vote in this country. It's compulsory in Australia. You pay a fine in Australia if you don't turn out to vote. It's not the same here. But that's what I'm talking about. It's like what, it's not the twists. I like would go to college campuses, because I do a lot of, yeah. and it's how do we make it easier 
for everyone to vote versus going to a polling booth. With technology today, yeah. we should be able, we should work on this. We should be able to come up with a way yeah. that more people, even though shame on people that, do, that don't vote. But yes, yes, it is our, Well, that's why uh, we're such big advocates and a big part of our legal team try to make early vote and vote by mail more accessible universally in the country. Traditionally, you have to have a pretty strong excuse to be able to vote by mail. But Tuesday, like a Tuesday daytime election, is disproportionately hard for people in urban areas, people who have multiple jobs, people who have childcare, people who are single parents, and those people are more likely to be on the, the Democratic side. So the more we can make it possible for people to vote early, electronically, by mail, not be tied to a Tuesday in November, that will have a big impact. Yeah, I think so. And then just to try to finish, what I was, what I was trying to say is that with your limited resources, you know, you're talking to the people you think most need to be activated. Whether they haven't registered to vote, they're not going to turn out, or they have to be persuaded. And with more time and more money, we would have, you know, there's always a, a point where you stop because you, you run out of something. And so with more time, more money, um, uh, and more people, we could have gotten to a longer part of the, the kind of curve of people who we were trying to reach. But you also didn't think you needed to. I mean, that's... It's right? not that we didn't think we No, I wouldn't say we didn't, but we, we're like, you're limited. You have to raise all the money. And I had a hard time recruiting. Like, people were not falling through my door to be engineers on the campaign. You know, we had to fight for every engineer we hired. And so, yeah, we could have done more. Everyone could have done more. Yeah. I think every voter could have done more, every volunteer, every person on the campaign. It's just, again, with the fixed time, fixed money, fixed people. Well, I think you killed it. And I think you created some new um, technology that will be, you know, embraced in you know elections to come so i i think that that is really you. you know quite amazing let me uh, let me just, just say this because oh. i'm so proud yeah. like in case any of my team is watching i could not be more proud like what these 80 people did like we probably launched more than 100 products um we raised hundreds of millions of dollars online we talked to hundreds of millions of voters we brought text messaging to the forefront which i think was a hard transition for people who had been in campaigns for a That's long time new, the, texting is like the new you know, emailing, yeah, right? Yeah, like, who wants a stranger to show up at their door during dinner? Who wants a phone call from somebody they've never? I actually did in New Hampshire. I did phone calls during the Super Bowl. Don't do it. <laughs> People do not want to hear from you during the Super Bowl. And I was just like, like, why are you guys picking up your phone? They're so angry at me. But they picked up their phone. I was like, don't do it. Um, but text messaging is less invasive. It's easy. We had conversations. And you could respond when you People want to. People could respond. People said, oh, great. I want to vote. I'm not registered. How do I do it? I want to vote. I don't remember my polling location or hours. Like, you can do so much in this, like, non-invasive communication and then and yeah we just really innovated on the whole infrastructure for how analytics and modeling happens at the campaign so I just could not be more proud so of course everyone could have done more and we wished really really hard for a different outcome but this team was like astronomically wonderful that's amazing and I, I'd like to talk to you about those tools moving forward how we can embrace them to connect us on equality yeah. and on important messaging. So let's take advantage of what you created and, and use that moving forward. Are you still working with Hillary on, you know, um, what's next for her? And no. so no. everyone is just taking a... I'm, sh I'm confident there's a large set of people working on what's next for her. Um, I'm still involved in some of the technology pieces and my focus is how do we create a legacy because a House, a Senator, a Governor's race cannot afford an 80-person engineering team um, and so all of the tools we built, there's no reason they can't be used to advance all candidates in the Democratic Party. So my energy is sort of how do we create a legacy? How do we make this a permanent sustaining part of the party instead of a boom bust cycle where Obama 08 had a big team and then it went away and Obama 12 had a big team and it went away and Hillary had a big team and it went away. Like that would just be a huge loss. But I was thinking, what if we create this tech hub that it's people that could access those tools for you know what they need it for versus all this work going away yeah. you know so I guess my, my my last question is you know we do a lot with dress for success we do a lot of impact work and you know we're working on a whole initiative of who opened the door for you yeah um, because if you really think about who opened the door for you yeah it's our imperative to open the door for this next generation so who opened the door for you yeah it's a great question I, when I, I, I thought back, I, um, I went to Stanford when I was 17, um, but my parents had just gone through a divorce and there wasn't money to keep me at Stanford. I wanted to study computer science there. And there was a professor in the um, engineering school there. His name was uh, Dr. Lozano. And he took an interest in me. He wanted to support me. And he eventually helped me apply for a 
Women in Computer Science scholarship from Intel. And that's what made it possible for me. Winning that scholarship made it possible for me to um, stay at Stanford. And I haven't thought about him in so many years until you asked that question. And I've never thought about going back there and thanking him, because I think being at Stanford and studying computer science at Stanford is what set me on this career path. Is he still teaching? I have no idea, but I'm going to okay, find Okay, let's find out. him. And if you do, let's bring him here and yeah. let's thank him publicly. <laughs> I would love that. Um, because if it weren't for him, you wouldn't be doing the work that you're doing. And I just want you to know you are inspiring so many other women to thank know you. that they can break and smash that glass ceiling and anything is possible. And you are a role model and inspiration to all of us. And I can't wait to really tap into that tech that you've been creating and socialize it um, you know, publicly so that all of us can you know, take advantage of it. So thank you so much for coming. And we love you. <laughs>